Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Eric Brewer, professor in computer science, and I get the honor of introducing our speaker today. A uh, few bits of business first. Uh, this is part of the Technology for Emerging Regions theme of Citrus, and I get to mention a few things about that that are important. Um, first, this is a, a nice talk in the, that you'll hear about in the sense that uh, she has the word coevolution in her in her title. And um, I like that because one of the reasons for doing this long ago, when we started this in 2003, was the idea that this is a two-way street and that the reason that students in California should care about developing regions is besides the, the philanthropic reasons are because there's plenty to learn. And so we'll see some of that today, which is great. Um, we're also opening a new building that you might have heard about. That's on the 27th. And the tier group and uh, much of the work in this area will be in the new building on the fourth floor. So you're welcome to come visit us. Uh, we won't be there on the 27th. I mean, the demos of stuff will be there. But we won't actually have moved in on that date. Also wanted to thank Infineon for sponsoring the lunch today. And uh, welcome our web viewers, which I guess are over there on that camera. Uh, finally, there's the Big Ideas contest, which has been uh, actually quite a good vehicle for research in technology for developing regions and has been used to fund trips to fun places. Uh, so you should, the flyers in the back, you can take a look at that. And then finally, uh, let's talk about our speaker, Jenna Burrell. She's new faculty in the School of Information. She got her PhD at the London School of Economics and Sociology, which brings it to me my second point I like about Citrus, which is it's not all EECS. And that's super important for this theme in particular, but it's also great to see uh, sociologists involved and also to see, frankly, the great turnout for this kind of multidisciplinary talk. She was also a CS undergrad, so, you know, she can, she can talk the talk, which comes in handy. Uh, certainly, it's a, it's a challenge to do multidisciplinary work. And finally, I would point out she's done the other thing I like about our theme, which is we go to the places that we're talking about. So she's done work in Ghana, including, I think, nine months in Ghana. She's done work in India, and this project's in Uganda. So with that, please welcome Jenna Burrell. So I feel compelled to clarify that I haven't yet done any work in India. I've worked with Indians, yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm a sociologist by training, as Eric has pointed out, um, and my particular research interest is in the uptake of new information and communication technologies, ICTs. Um, I'm specifically interested in the internet and mobile phones. And to narrow things down a little bit further, um, what I have decided to focus my energy on is uh, the Sub-Saharan Africa region. Um, I did spend nine months in Ghana, and uh, the research that I've been doing recently has been in Uganda. Um, what I've been doing in Uganda is spending time in rural villages, uh, trying to understand really concretely what value Ugandans have found in gaining access to mobile phones. So I'm going to talk about that at length today. Um, first of all, let me um, just focus uh, a little bit on how I'm going to structure this talk. Um, I was asked to give a talk about the impact of technology on developing regions, something under that, that subject matter. And indeed, on my website, I talk about the fact that I'm quite interested in um, the impact of large-scale technology diffusion um, in places like Ghana and Uganda. Um, that's kind of a shortcut, because the word impact is really problematic. And I'm going to talk about why it's problematic right here uh, with this slide. Um, there's a lot of discussion among social scientists like myself about whether it's possible to talk about the impact of technology on society in a unidirectional sense, isolating causal force to the technological form by itself. Um, and doubts are raised on several fronts. First of all, um, because the process of developing technology does not escape social forces. Um, I'm not going to be able to go into all the examples I could raise here, but if anyone's really interested in this, I'm happy to point you towards some readings. Um, so there have been some fantastic historical um, accounts of the spread of the automobile, the bicycle, the refrigerator, the telephone that have taken on this perspective and asked that question about 
um, what the social influence is on development processes. Uh, the second uh, area of doubt that's raised about this idea of technology having a, an impact is that engineers, people who work to design these devices, are members of society. And their ideas and their efforts are subject in part to their socialization, just like everyone else in society. Um, what engineers think is interesting, is worthwhile, is marketable, is in part a product of that socialization. And then thirdly, um, the technological forms themselves that find their way into the social world are often malleable. They can be used in unanticipated ways, even subversive ways, ways that their, their designers never intended, um, never imagined they would be used for. And that last bullet point I'm going to talk a bit about when I talk about money transfers, um, Ugandan student money transfer on mobile phones. Um, this third item, I think, raises the question of whether it might be just as reasonable to talk about how society impacts technology. Um, how, and, and especially how that might be important to our thinking about how to design technologies that will be welcomed by users, that will be adaptable, that will be useful. Um, what I found in rural Uganda was that the flexibility of mobile phones was key to their significance in that part of the world. Um, they could accommodate any language as long as both the caller and the receiver spoke that language. Um, they could support communication on any topic. Um, it turned out to be a very open-ended technological device that was easy for rural Ugandans to adapt to their interests. Um, okay. The second thing I want to address is um, a particular bit of rhetoric that is uh, recurrent in the way that people address the possibility of introducing new technologies into the developing world. And that bit of rhetoric is the idea of the developing world, and Africa in particular, as a technological blank slate. And this is a great example. This is a bit dated. This is from 1993. But um, this is a paper from the communications of the ACM, which if you're a computer scientist, you're probably familiar with the ACM, um, entitled Sub-Saharan Africa, a Technological Desert. And uh, I teach a class called Technology and Poverty, and I... I bring up this slide and I ask students to kind of do a, an analysis of the image here. It's a really intriguing, troubling kind of image. You have this sub-Saharan Africa region, just, it's the dark continent. It's a, an, a black space where no technology exists. Um, 1993, you could probably make that claim that the internet, mobile phones, technologies of that nature weren't very widespread, but you know, how is the term technology being constraint. Automobiles were certainly widespread in parts of Africa in 1993, for example. So, you know, there's a great use to this image. Um, it's something that many of us researchers, engineers, politicians, development practitioners have at one time or another relied on, um, you know, to make the claim that we're going to go introduce some system and that device, that technology, those capabilities don't exist already. Right? It's a good justification for a project. Unfortunately, it's turning out to be quite inaccurate. So I have one, one slide with a graph on it. Um, the statistics on this issue, on the spread of mobile phones, are really problematic. Um, partly because they are becoming outdated as soon as they're published. Um, the spread of mobile phones is so rapid that um, it's really hard to get a handle on how widespread they are in places like Uganda. The Ugandan census data, the most recent data I could find was from 2002. And a world of change has happened since then. Um, there's also some problems about the questions that are being asked and the ways the, the data is being gathered. Um, so the census data looks at um, mobile phones per household. And as a sociologist, I'm really interested in what's going on within the household. Within a household, who's using the phone? Um, so the granularity is a little problematic from my perspective. Um, what I want to do, I want to challenge this rhetoric of Africa as a place that's absent of technology, but I want to do it in a really concrete way um, by showing how if we were to acknowledge what's emerging, what is happening on the ground, 
what sense rural Ugandans are making of these mobile phones, what novel um, uh, utility they're devising from these devices, that that can be a really powerful source of inspiration for better and more useful design for those of us who are interested in building and engineering solutions for that part of the world. Okay. Um, there's this concept of indigenous innovation, which perhaps people are familiar with. I want to broaden the way we think about that term. Um, I think in general, when people refer to indigenous innovation, they're talking about in innovation under constraints, under extraordinary constraints often, um, relying on locally available resources. Um, and if we expand that concept a little bit to include the ways in which um, people in developing regions, places like rural Uganda, are engaging with modern technologies, are uncovering latent possibilities in those technologies, that I think is a a slightly broader understanding of what indigenous innovation might be um, that escapes the, the tendency to draw a, a strong distinction between modern technologies, modern um, innovation, and pre-modern or um, localized innovation. Um, I see no such strong distinction. Um, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the website AfroGadget. It's worth looking up. Um, that is a, it's a really interesting site where they, they're frequently posting um, some things that would be under this, this label, indigenous innovation. Um, and this is actually a, one of the most recent postings um, from that site. A uh, Ugandan woman who has figured out a way to make a phone charger using uh, batteries, size D batteries. Very clever. Um, and one thing this just points out right off the bat is, uh, which I also found to be true when I was doing my research, um, which is that people are finding ways to access these devices when they're not on the electricity grid, when they don't have reliable ele electricity access. Um, and one um, important local innovation that I think should be highlighted is the, um, the business service of offering charging phone charging off of car batteries often that local entrepreneurs have discovered is a, a way to make money and also to keep uh, phones charged in their area when there's not you know, good, reliable electricity. Okay. Um, before I get into the heart of, of this talk, I wanted to just go over my methodological approach and the field sites I visited in particular. Um, I've done now a total of about nine weeks of field work, which is um, far less than the nine months that I spent in Ghana. Um, but I've done this trip on, on two distinct um, trips. I went first in November and December of 2007 for uh, four weeks, and then I went this past summer for five weeks. And really what I was focused on doing was um, trying to get out into some you know, remote, non-electrified villages, um, do interviews in people's homes or in their workplaces, um, in situ interviews, and um, to also try to tour their phones, look at what people were doing with their phones to get a concrete sense of what they're, what they're using the phones for, looking through call logs, looking through address books, um, looking at text messages, you know, to the extent that people are permitting me to, to view those things. Um, and it's broadly an ethnographic approach. I consider myself to be an ethnographer, although it's confined to a very short time frame, so um, some people would argue for the authenticity of that, that um, practice as ethnographic. Um, I used an inductive analytical approach, so basically, uh, what I was doing, I was, I was doing interviews, I was transcribing those interviews, I was asking very open-ended questions, and then looking across interviews to see the themes that were emerging, very bottom-up. Um, I was not there testing a hypothesis of any sort. I was trying to understand from the bottom-up, how are people using phones? How are rural Ugandans using phones? Um, and I selected uh, four villages, trying to get 
you know, decent spread across parts, different parts of the country. The first village was by far the most remote. Um, it was on a lake in the center of, of Uganda, Lake um, Choga, and uh, it was mm, like a good two and a half hour taxi ride from the nearest paved road. Um, and really the only reason people were there is because of the lake. Um, there were a lot of people who had migrated from the less politically stable northern part of the country. A lot of migrants coming through, both fishermen and people escaping the, the political conflicts. And um, the livelihoods people pursued were really usually oriented around fishing. Um, village B was a mid-sized trading town, as it says. Uh, village C was uh, an area where there was a lot of farming going on. And then Village D was another fishing village, but a more um, prosperous one on Lake Victoria. Um, I have a whole kind of typology of livelihood strategies I was, I was trying to understand that I have not included in the slide set, but I was trying to get a sense of how people connected mobile phones into the way they went about their everyday lives, um, how they generated income, how they pursued business, how, broadly, how they kept in touch with family, how they negotiated financial matters. Um, and by separating out different livelihoods people might pursue, I was trying to get a good range of experiences. So the livelihood strategies I, um, I broke down into four categories. One was farming and fishing and you know, living off the land, basically. Um, the second was um, trade of any sort, from you know, bananas to cassette tapes. Uh, third category was um, uh, small-scale manufacturing, so I talked to a furniture maker, uh, people who were doing scrap metal repurposing, and then finally service industry workers, so the guys who drive you around on motorbikes, um, people who run restaurants, etc. So the data I collected, by and large, were interview transcripts and the daily field notes that I kept about what I observed, um, about the ways people were using their mobile phones and, and other activities going on in these villages. OK. Um, this is basically the, the structure of the rest of the, the uh, presentation. What I want to talk about are three strategies that researchers might pursue for examining local innovation, examining the ways people are embracing and repurposing and discovering new possibilities in the mobile phone, for example. Um, the first uh, strategy, a good entry point, I think, is to look at the local social commentary about phones in both the formal and informal media. Um, I've made it a practice now when I go off to do field work to, if possible, collect um, newspaper clippings because there's so much of interest in there about mobile phones and gender relations and um, uh, you know, ways in which people are losing all their money to buy airtime and you know, whether it's a threat to your health to have a mobile phone. It's a whole range of, of um, concerns and, and uh, ideas about mobile phones that are visible in the public media. Um, I think it's a, a difficult to limit yourself to the formal media, though, because there's also an incredible richness to the informal media, the jokes people tell about phones, the colloquialisms, the uh, rumors people tell. That um, media that's not controlled by institutional bodies can tell you incredible amounts about what people are concerned about, what conflicts they see is ar that are arising from a new technology, um, and uh, you know, what place these new technologies are finding in those societies. The second strategy is to um, actually trace the circulation of a new technology, a, a particular device, to understand who obtains access to it and how. Um, what are the normative social arrangements that come into play in the way that benefits are realized from phones? Um, there's a lot of focus in uh, the domain of mobile phone use in driving down the prices, getting the prices lower and lower so, so a wider segment of society can access those phones. But price is not the end point, the, end, um, the final deciding point about whether someone will get access to a phone. 
and I'll go into some details about that. Um, the other thing to think about is the role played by local small businesses and entrepreneurs in delivering access to these technologies. So um, the Ugandan Communication Commission, which um, regulates the telecom sector in Uganda, put out a report last year. What was really interesting to me about this report was that um, they pointed out that there were about 6,000 people employed in the telecom sector on the formal side. So those are people working for MTN, working for Celtel, you know, formally employed with some of these telecom businesses. Um, on the informal side, there were 350,000 people working in the telecom sector. Those are the guys selling mobile phones, selling airtime, selling charging services, etc. And without those guys on the ground, these phones would not have gotten out nearly as far into the rural areas and into the hands of a broader range of members of society. Okay, and then finally, um, I think this is probably when people imagine how users are repurposing or reinventing um, technologies. They're probably thinking about direct manipulation of the phone. And that's the, f the final strategy for examining local innovation, is to try and figure out um, how people are discovering new, directly with the phone, new possibilities for use. Um, but I'm going to go through the first two strategies to begin with. Okay, so this is an ad from one of the local newspapers, the Daily Monitor. Uh, it's an ad that appeared around Valentine's Day, and the text says, Isimu ya malavu, which means um, phone of love in Luganda. Um, and it's an advertisement encouraging men to buy phones for the special women in their lives. And in Uganda, that could mean a number of wives and or girlfriends. Um, that right there, I think, gives you a little indication about what you might pursue to understand, you know, how phones are being received in these parts of the world. Um, one thing I find completely absent from statistics on mobile phone use in the developing world is the phenomenon of phone gifting. No one seems to be collecting data on how many people are obtaining access to phones as gifts. Um, so. That right there would kind of give you a, a sign that that's happening uh, in a widespread way. Um, one of the best discoveries I made on my last trip to Uganda was a music video, which I'm going to play for you now. Um, that certainly serves as social commentary on the role mobile phones are finding in male-female relationships in Uganda. So this is, in, this is in Luganda, but I've got a translation, so I'll translate as you listen. It, I'm going to warn you that it's eight minutes long, but I'll probably cut it off at about five minutes. about. You womanize her. These women are calling you and yet I'm your wife. You aren't meeting my needs. I don't even have money to buy myself a bra. Yet you spend money on these women, prostitutes. So I'm going to crush your phone. The translation at the beginning is not very precise. It gets more precise. Based on their clothing, you can, you can tell that they're rural people. She's dressed in a very traditional um, style of dress. She 
saying something about, I'm going to crush your phone and then you can take it up with MTN. saying, you white people who brought us these mobile phones brought problems to us. Yet the phones are meant to uplift development in Africa. But the problem that I've foreseen in Uganda, we are still ignorant in relation to the phone. We should have had lessons about the mobile phone before you brought it, especially the married couples. So the couples can know that a husband can get a phone call from anyone, and the wife can get a phone call from anyone. He says, what's so big about me getting a phone call? You are very disrespectful. You are calling me a womanizer before our children. You should desist from listening to my phone calls. That phone call I got is from my mother. There's the mother. Um, he says, so does that mean I'm having an affair with my mother? I think you're mad. Please have nothing to do with my phone. That's the reason that I bought you that phone. This is him buying his wife's phone. I gave it for you to play with as you wish. But have nothing to do with my phone. You'll get in trouble next time. She says, I've been looking for a disease that will kill me, but now you are here. So let me crush the phone, and we'll see how you kill me. Instead of continuing to argue, when you are in the wrong, you should admit you are wrong. I heard a prostitute's voice talking on that phone. How could that be your mother? And even that way you've been speaking on the phone in a romantic voice. I can tell the difference when you are talking to other women who are not your mother. Ever since you bought me that phone, how many men have you heard calling me on that phone? I don't give men my contact number, but you womanizers of this town, we always find your contact numbers in pit latrines. There, there's going to be an image of that in a minute. There's the pit latrine with the, the phone number in it. Um, you leave them there so women can get in touch with you. So I'm going to crush your phone because I'm tired of these women who keep calling you when you are in this house. So let MTN be the one to pay you back after I've crushed your phone. That's her phone. So he says, before I crush you, first let me know who was calling you. Tell me why you were enjoying that call so much. I've always been hearing reports that you were a prostitute and I've not been believing those rumors. But this is confirmation that you have men. So we need police to come and help us settle this matter. I'm going to crush your phone. Who gave you permission to give out your contact number to men? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it here. There's a section that follows um, where they reconcile, um, which I'm not letting you see. She, she claims the phone number was from her uncle, and uh, the phone call was from her uncle. And um, he ends by giving advice and saying, you know, married couples shouldn't listen into each other's phone calls. Um, the phones are easy to be with uh, if you trust each other. 
Um, even if the phone rings 100 times and you're next to it and the owner is away, don't try to receive it. Okay, so giving advice about how to manage the phone in relationships. Yeah, all right, should I, am I probably not supposed to take any questions, but do you have a burning question? No, I was just wondering, how popular is that song? I'm not sure, but it was, I mean, it was quite popular. My research assistant knew about it and looked it up for me. So I didn't dig through an archive to find it, for example. It was in fairly widespread circulation. Um, but it was popular before I showed up, so I, don't, I, I only heard it when someone brought it to my attention. Okay, so that's a good starting point um, for thinking about what sorts of issues are raised by the arrival of mobile phones. Clearly from that video you can see that there are issues around gender relations. There are issues around um, male-female relationships. There are issues around gifting of phones. Um, and that takes me to the next slide, um, which is about um, the circulation of phones. Um, tracing how these technologies are spreading out into communities and, and the dynamic that, that informs that. Um, those of us who are trying to design technology interventions to put into place to improve social conditions in one way or another, we have to contend with the way those technologies are being mapped onto existing normative social arrangements. Um, how those mappings may amplify or undermine the changes we're hoping to create. The gender relations are really important in, in this sense in Uganda. Um, I've been focusing a lot of energy trying to figure out patterns of phone gifting and sharing in Uganda. That's been the focus of the research that I've done so far. Um, one thing that I realized once I started reviewing um, how people obtained phones and how they were using them and how many people were using them was that there were five distinct roles a person can have in relationship to a phone. Uh, one can be the purchaser of the phone, one can be the owner, one can be the possessor, one can be the operator, or one could be the user. So you, certainly you could have more than one of those roles. But what's really interesting in a place like Uganda is that they often get divided up to different people. Um, and a single phone can have many, many users. Um, I'm not going to go over the fine distinctions between each of those roles, because I usually get questions about what the difference is between an operator and a user. Um, I can tell you, but I, I don't think I have time to go into it here. Um, I do want to talk about a few patterns of sharing. Um, one problematic one, one that concerns me, and one that I see as very pro-social and important to, to consider. The first is the way that women obtain phones in rural Uganda. Um, they're often obtaining those phones as gifts. Uh, they typically are relying on their husband. If they're going to have a phone, they're typically relying on their husband to decide he can afford it and that he's willing for his wife to have a phone. And the financial issues are not the final issue. Um, for many men, as this, this video reflects, there is concern about wives having access to other men through the phone. So what I saw in Uganda was a lot of policing of access to phones among women by men. So men who offered, one man in particular that I talked to in the first village I went to, um, he pretty much would share his phone with anyone. If you brought airtime, you could use his phone to call someone, which was great for that community um, of people who some had phones and some didn't, and there weren't regularly accessible public phones. Um, but he wouldn't allow married women to use his phone because there was an incident where a woman had used his phone to call a boyfriend of hers, and the husband had come up to him later and said, why did you permit my wife to use your phone? She called her boyfriend. Right? So there was kind of an agreement among men to um, police that, that behavior. Um, that's a... That's a a pattern of sharing that I find to be really problematic. Um, the other thing I, I, I observed was that sometimes men were able to use the phone as a sort of lure to attract women to them. Um, in one village, um, I had a really frank discussion with a middle-aged woman who was there trading smoked fish. She was buying smoked fish and taking them to her village to sell. And she observed, this is a quote from the interview, because some women in this village come and do fish trading, um, they want to communicate to their families, so they have to look for someone with a phone. So if a man has a phone, he would be very happy because he knows it's a way of getting women, and if you refuse his advances, then he will not give you the phone. Right? So 
the gifting of phones is a, could be a pro-social thing, but when there are strings attached to that, that gift, that's, that's something to, to account for and contend with. Um, by contrast, let me give you an example of a very obviously pro-social example of how certain people are getting preferential access to phones. Um, another pattern of sharing I found was that phones were being gifted to those in poor health. So family members, um, a mother of a, a young person who had some kind of illness, or an adult child who had a mother who was sick, would give that person a phone. And that, they could use that as a, a lifeline if there were any kinds of problems with their health. They could call and get um, transportation to the health clinic or something of that sort. Um, I have another quote from an interview that reflects this. Um, Oh, there it is, okay. Um, a woman I talked to in the second village who uh, was HIV positive, um, she described falling ill suddenly, um, and only her school age children were around to keep the house in order. She was making money selling secondhand clothes. Um, her husband had died years before, and her parents were dead. Um, she had a brother, but he was in South Africa, and she had no way of contacting him. So um, what she said in her interview was, uh, when I was sick, I suffered a lot to the extent that I could even fail to get what to eat. I did not have anyone to help me out, and that brother of mine was not here, and I had no way of communicating to him. So when he came and found out that I had gotten so ill to that extent, he decided to give a phone so that we can communicate in case of anything. Um, both my parents are dead, so I have no one else to help me apart from that brother of mine. So, um, certainly while efforts to drive down the price of phones and phone services are key for spreading access to broader segments of society, um, that's not the only mechanism through which access is provided. Um, there is a local cultural logic of resource distribution that is at play. And that can be very, very encouraging in the ways that family members give their ill family members the gift of a phone. And it can be more troubling as when women are denied access for legitimate uses um, because the men in their, their social world are concerned about the misuses they may put that phone to. Okay, I'm going to get to the, the third approach to, um, to thinking about user, user innovation, innovation around mobile phones, um, which is the case of money transfers in Uganda. So I actually, oops, sorry, there goes the jangling necklace, sorry. Um, I brought a couple of props. Um, this is the kind of phone people typically are using in rural Uganda, the Nokia brick phone. Um, and this is what airtime cards look like. So if you want to buy some, if you want to make a phone call, you might go buy some airtime, find someone who has a phone, um, type in the code on the back to load that credit onto the phone and then make your call. Um, what people in Uganda figured out how to do was to take this little code, type it into a text message, and then send it to someone. And then that recipient of the code can sell it for money. It's a very clever way of transferring money from point A to point B in Uganda. Um, why I think it's so important is because it's, it's very clever and it also reflects demand for a service that might be better supported than through airtime codes. Um, I think actually MTN is about to start a, a legitimate money transfer program. Um, but those ways in which people figure out how to unlock um, you know, possibilities in these modern technologies that the original inventors had never thought of is really powerful. And Building on that momentum seems an absolutely worthwhile um, direction to pursue projects and, and interventions that will support those, those needs. And it is the case in Uganda. I have this image of this woman here who um, lived in a village. She was, she was making a really good um, living trading in provisions, sugar, salt, things like that. And periodically, she wanted to send money to her elderly mother in another village. So that kind of activity is certainly worth supporting. Sometimes, because it was difficult to transfer the, the credit rather than actually transferring money, um, she would do things like put a bag of flour on a taxi 
and pay the taxi driver to, to get it to the right destination. So there are a number of different ways in which people have figured out how to transfer materials money from point A to point B. And um, what I want to say in my final five minutes is um, to talk a little bit more directly about the possibilities for design around these local innovations. Um, I think the, the promise of the standard Nokia brick phone has been underestimated. Um, this is the phone that you're seeing all over rural Uganda. Um, and what it has, it provides connectivity, it has a little bit of processing power, it has a little bit of data storage. Um, if you were able to design a service for this phone, um, it would be an incredibly efficient use of resources. Uh, it would potentially have a very broad scope of influence, anyone who already has one of these phones. Um, and it would build on the momentum of current practices of use. So I'm going to talk about a couple of ideas I have around, around that possibility. The first is extending mobile financial services. So implementing systems that will do money transfer. Um, helping people who don't have access to banks or microfinance institutions to open bank accounts, to keep track of their bank accounts with their phone, uh, to pay off loans with the phone, to perhaps implement insurance programs through the phones. Um, a really powerful way to overcome remoteness. Um, there's a system I've been talking to, to uh, someone about lately that would allow you to order things at the local shop with your phone, like a bag of flour, for example, and have that delivered to the person you want it to deliver it to. So not just maybe transferring money, but finding ways to provide you know, materials, food, clothing, things like that. Um, in the case where people don't want to or are unable to transfer money in cash form. Um, the second idea um, I have about around this is really to uh, push the processing power to more powerful devices, but to use these brick phones as a way to connect to, like, through a call center model. Um, using the power of these phones to support any language as long as the caller and the receiver speak that language. So instead of doing information services through text messaging, why not have a call center where someone can call and speak in Luganda, request some kind of information, request some kind of service, and use that intermediary who perhaps is more skilled, has uh, you know, more powerful technologies at their disposal. Um, this, there's a particular project of this nature and that's been implemented in India, and if you're interested, you can follow that link. Okay, and I, I mean, I spent a lot of time talking about um, patterns of sharing and the ways in which um, phones got into the hands of people other than through money power, um, buying phones or coming up with the resources to purchase items. So through gifting, for example. And in coming up with projects, coming up with implementations, um, those sorts of patterns need to be contended with. So, for example, what I would now say based on my research is that um, an SMS messaging system that targets women is not likely to reach that population because um, women are often denied um, ownership of phones and um, women who share phones with their husbands often are not permitted to operate or possess those phones. So what I heard from a lot of women that I interviewed was that um, they didn't have the rehearsed skill of doing SMS messaging. They didn't know how to get to it in the phone. They didn't know how to type out messages. Um, there was a real divide between men and women in their capacity to do that that went beyond literacy levels. Um, yeah, and the other thing to contend with in designing these kinds of interventions is the fact that um, any project designed with um, ideas about better social arrangement, better social services, um, should think about the ways in which those benefits might be amplified or undermined in the ways that people share and gift and use phones together in places like rural Uganda. That, that's the end. I'm right on time. Great. So I'll take any questions now. Um, 
One question I had is uh, if you're seeing significant difference in usage of phones between urban and rural areas. That's a great question. I, so I've been doing, in Uganda, I've exclusively been doing research in rural areas. And my hope is to go back this summer and add some urban field sites to the study. So I couldn't even tell you yet. But ask me in six months or so. I have a question. Are you working with specific people in Uganda on these projects, or is this mainly you coming from Berkeley? Um, I have a brilliant research assistant there who's a PhD student in the Department of Sociology at Makerere, and I rely heavily on his language skills. And um, he's doing research on fishing, uh, fishing and natural resource management. And um, so he's kind of paved the way for me to go to some of his field sites where he's built good rapport with, with people in those communities, and that's eased the way. That's made it possible to do, you know, 50 interviews of good quality in 10 weeks. Tangential to what you've described, which is fascinating, uh, did you observe any impact on healthcare delivery or, or the way people get access to, to clinics or to clinicians or medications, anything like that? I heard... Um, from, I interviewed a traditional birth attendant in the, the first village in um, Village A. I'll go back to the map. Um, and she was using text messaging and phone, her phone. It was a phone she shared with her husband. He was pretty generous with the, the use of the phone, though. Um, and uh, was finding that it was useful for emergency situations. Um, she could call a clinic and tell them that a, a woman was on the way, um, prepare them for her arrival. Um, she could check in with, with patients, um, find out if they, how they were doing. Um, because one of the big issues in these areas is just remoteness and the, the expense of traveling. So trying to reach people across great distances, people who aren't able to travel, um, was really useful in that sense. I was wondering um, if you had a sense for, you know, like the banking, the informal banking and stuff like that. Was it pretty uniform in the different places? Like everyone was kind of using the services in the same way? Um, and if, or if kind of, you know, the areas that were more urban? The money transfer? Yeah. Yeah. yeah or some of the other behaviors. Um, I didn't notice differences between the areas that I visited, but I did. I mean, one thing I didn't highlight in this talk was. Um, the reasons people gave me for not doing money transfer, um, which included things like it, was, it could be difficult to sell airtime codes. It could, they weren't a very liquid asset. It could be difficult to find someone who would pay cash for the, the airtime codes. Um, so it wasn't, you know, the purpose of sending money by phone is that it gets there immediately. Um, but if you can't sell the airtime codes immediately, then that, that benefit is negated. So. Um, I'm trying to think. There were other reasons. I'm Those trying to. Can be used more than once. Or can be used more than once. Right? So yeah. You use the code and then it's, then it's code used up. Valid. Yeah. Use right. Yeah. Um, although I didn't hear any concerns about that, but that is true. Um, the other thing that I still am trying to work out is it seemed like certain people were insistent about sending goods rather than cash. And um, some of the. I have an inkling of an idea about why that is. It may be that the person you want to gift something to can't be trusted with cash, um, or that a bag of flour, for example, is going to last for a long time, whereas if you send you know, $2, that'll get used up really quickly. Um, I talked to a woman in one village who said that um, it's traditional to be sending money, resources, food to your, your parents, to your elderly parents. Um, but she said that, you know, our parents don't need cash, they need food. So food was the appropriate thing to be sending to your parents. So there are a number of issues at play that I'm still trying to work out. Do you have an insight in which functions of the phone they use preferred? Like, is it more t speech or text, or do they even some consider already applications or mobile internet like we have here? No, no, I've heard almost nothing about mobile internet. There was one guy in the first village who was able to pull up pictures of, of um, Miss Uganda. <laughs> he, called the, he called the support line and asked, 
about a particular function. He didn't know what it was, and it was a, a mobile internet function. That, that was the extent of what he did with it. Though. Um, but I heard very little awareness of the internet or computers. I mean, we had laptops, and kids came up and said, what is that? Is that a radio? Um, and uh, what people were using it, I mean, the universally applicable uh, service is typing in numbers and calling people and talking to them directly. Everyone can do that. Um, there was a, a significant amount of SMS messaging going on, too. But those were by far the two dominant um, features. There were people, I mean, people were using address books. Um, some people were using it, some people who clearly had literacy issues were using it. Um, just to type in numbers, but without the names attached. Um, and they would just memorize what number went with who, which was interesting. So, yeah. Nothing like text messaging? Uh, SMS is uh, text messaging. And, um, uh, I mean, the picture messaging? No, no, no. The Nokia, I mean, the Nokia brick, just keep this in mind. It doesn't do picture messaging, no. So, um, have cell phone companies tried to take into account the social constraints and uses that you describe when they design their products? So, say, for example, if one phone could uh, allow some, when the processor of the phone to restrain some users to, for, to some function, to allow the wife for texting, for example, whatever. Sorry, what was the question? So, have cell phone companies tried to implement some of the, some new functions in the phone that will take into account the constraints, uh, the social constraints you describe? Yeah, not as far as I know. I mean, this is very late-breaking research, so I have a, I'm giving a talk at Nokia in March. We'll see if I can, I don't know, convince someone to... <laughs> well, it's, I mean, I, I have a background in CS, and I did for a while um, do HCI research, for those of you who know what that means. Um, and I did build things. And I'm, I am interested in what you might build, create, put out into the world as a result of this kind of research. I'm now a sociologist, so I observe and report. But I would love to talk to some people about you know, what ideas make sense for just the brick phone, how we can leverage the brick phone to, to reach um, people who are clearly um, in remote, poor regions um, now, who now have a little bit of connectivity and some processing power and you know, just a little bit of data storage. What you can do with that new world order. Are people there uh, primarily getting uh, new phones, or are these mostly phones that are you know donated from or you know discarded by first world countries? As far as I know, they're not discarded. I mean, w what I did see is people buying secondhand phones from other people they knew. Um, I talked to phone sellers who I don't think they always know the origins of the phones they're getting, but they're they're coming packaged. Um, they're coming from sources in Nairobi, Kenya, for example. Um, and they're being sold as new. So if, uh, you know, if say, Nokia were to you know, make changes to their phone, they, you know, more in the interest of supporting these users, it would actually get into their hands you know, within a reasonable time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I think that's absolutely true. And there, is a, uh, there are certain models of phone that, um, that come out newly from Nokia that end up being the best sellers in, in rural Uganda, according to the phone sellers that I've interviewed. Um, whatever is the, the cheapest Nokia phone is the phone that sells because there's brand recognition and trust in Nokia as being durable, which I'm sure Nokia will love to hear this when I talk to them in March. But it's, it's pretty clear that, that um, they also have these um, Chinese-made phones that don't have the same reputation for being durable but often have extra features, features that um, certain features that are really crucial there, like having uh, supporting multiple SIM cards, um, because when you move around parts of rural Uganda, sometimes you might be in MTN range, sometimes you might be in cell tel range, um, sometimes if you're receiving calls from someone on MTN, it's cheapest for them to call your MTN number. So phones that can support SIM cards for multiple networks are really useful in that part of the world. 
How universal is the actual cell phone coverage? You've mentioned a couple of different networks, and obviously in rural villages there's uh, at least uh, voice capability. Is there also data, and is that everywhere? Um, you know, there, there are statistics on this that I, I just cannot recall offhand um, that the Uganda Communication Commission keeps about um, the network shadow in Uganda. Um, the northern region has all sorts of issues, political issues. So, you know, putting that aside for now, um, the southern half of the country is, I would guess, probably in the 75% range in terms of coverage. Sometimes that coverage is really bad, but it's there. Actually, Curtis looked at that. Oh, what did he say? Am I totally off? No, no. Really, he basically said most rural villages could get some coverage if you went to the right spot. Yeah. It's a lot of fading from hills and things like that. The first this village, is a very hilly region, especially on yeah, the west. Yeah, that is something to contend with for sure. The first village I went to, I went to purposely because I thought it was beyond network range. And my research assistant had told me that people there had phones that didn't work. And I wanted to know what they were doing with those phones. Is it just because it's kind of you know, affordable luxury or status display or, but when I got there, people were on the network. They did have network coverage, so we couldn't find a place that didn't have some kind of coverage. All right, let's bring it to a close and thank our speaker.